Today we're going to be taking another look at my ongoing quest for the most realistic verdigree effects possible. So I hope you'll join me at the bench today to see how I'm coming along. Hi, welcome back to another Terranscapes video. Uh, today, I want to just start as mostly always by saying welcome so much everybody to this video. Welcome my new subscribers and all of the returning viewers. And even if you're not in one of those categories, you're still welcome on the channel. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Today is part three of my Verdigree experiments, trying to learn how to produce Verdigree uh, realistically. And uh, today we'll be taking a look at a couple uh, more common products that are available. One is going to be uh, GW's Nihilach Oxide and two uh, Verdigrees from uh, Vallejo. One is from their game color range and one is from their model color range. So I wanted to take a look at those and see what effects I could produce and I think you'll find it interesting. And I don't know if I've stressed this enough, maybe I have, but the goal of this is to achieve a truly realistic effect, at least as best as I can get, because nobody is doing verdigree right. Then I don't know how to do it right. That's why I'm trying to learn. And this is my opinion. And of course, there's always, there's no right or wrong way to create a, a, an art effect. I mean, it's art. You do what you want to do. Uh, and that's always first. You should like it. But I feel like I have not seen anybody doing verdigree accurately on miniatures uh, and I've looked around a lot, actually, <laughs> when I do my monthly columns. This is actually research for my third part of my monthly columns for Patreon. And I do an extensive amount of research trying to find well, what all the techniques are that people are using uh, out in the modeling world and see uh, which ones are working well and which ones aren't and why are they not working. And so I do this whole breakdown of all of those. So I feel like I've looked at a lot of people's work, uh, both within the miniature world and outside of it. And I've seen some that were really good. But in the miniature world, I think there's a really a big gap in uh, knowing about verdigree effects and how to produce them. So this series is my personal quest to discover that. And I've dissuaded. I already, I'm already reshooting this. I'm still saying dissuaded. I don't know why that's there. Decided to make this uh, join me at the bench format because I want you to see how I'm learning. This is, you're literally watching me learn. Uh, and I hope that it saves you some learning in the end, uh, or at least gives you some ideas about how to tackle your own experiments for a different effect that you might be looking for. And after the at the bench segment, I hope you will be sticking around for the viewer comments. I have some really good ones today where people have made some uh, suggestions on, on my content, other directions to go in, uh, an alternative on how to produce verdigree possibly. And so uh, those are going to be, I think, worth your while if you wait for them. But before we get any further, of course, it's cocktail time. So tonight's drink is a Satan's Whiskers. And this drink uh, comes from... Old Man Drinks. This book, uh, is, its origin in coming into my hands is unknown. I was just asking Tanya if she knew. Uh, not entirely sure. But it's a funny old book because it has a lot of classic drinks and some ones that are maybe definitely not in common drinking parlance at the moment. But um, it's also got these little quips let me read you one here. So it has a, a little picture of some old guy. And the quote here is, uh, you work hard, you have a roof over your head and food in your belly. To me, that was success. Nowadays, people ain't happy without their toys. Peter, 70, accountant. I had lots of time for the ladies and no, I won't tell you any stories about them. Dick, 80, factory worker. You ever notice how drunks get, <laughs> you ever notice how drunks speak gibberish? That's because you need a few stiff ones yourself to help translate. That's from Polly, 68, 
municipal worker. So it's got those all scattered throughout. And and the uh, drinks, like I said, are a little bit older fashioned, but this was where I discovered Satan's Whiskers. It has gin, uh, sweet vermouth, dry vermouth, Grand Marnier, and um, a dash, half an ounce of orange juice with a dash of orange bitters. And it, I it wouldn't say it's the most attractive drink in that uh, in certain lighting, it can look a little, you know, not the best color of orange, but it's pretty tasty and it's uh, almost a little bit refreshing. So I think it has a nice balance between the sweetness uh, not being too strong or too too little. As I mentioned, I think it's a bit refreshing. And Tanya just had a uh, taste a moment ago and her description was, um, it's the kind of drink you could have for breakfast. All right, so back again here, next day actually. And I wanted to give you an update of what I did. So uh, here I went over again with the Model Mates Verdigris. This is their green Verdigris, which um, maybe would look a little more intense if it was built up more, which I don't think it should be, uh, because here is the blue Verdigris and here's the green. Mm, not a huge difference. Uh, the other one does have a, a slightly bluer tint, but having uh, practiced on the other model uh, quite a bit, I took a little more careful uh, approach with focusing more on raised areas and trying to avoid puddling. And I like this. I like this effect a lot. I feel really, really good about it. It feels like it has a chalky look. It, it has a nice sort of granular appearance, if you will. I really, I was like, I like this. If you look, maybe I'll put a photo in the video here, but I was trying to emulate the first photo in the column, which is a uh, statue, and it has a sort of general verdigree over a dark background. And so that was the look I was going for here. And I think that comes pretty damn close, if you ask me. It could use a little more work in the hair, but uh, you know, I'm really looking for proof of concept and some general concepts of um, how to apply it and its overall effect. Next up, even though I love that, and I would, I'd be like, I'm done. I, I'd go with that. That's not really fair. First of all, I might be able to achieve better effect. And second of all, most people do not have a Model Mates Verdigree bottle sitting on their shelf. So it is, uh, I am beholden to uh, the modeling community to provide uh, alternatives and potentially find better effects. What I'm doing on this model here, oh, and what did I do? So I actually, this is the burn umber if you remember, I put a second layer of black wash. I actually used the other black wash I mentioned, the 80s, and it's pretty, pretty much the same. Uh, what's funny is that back in the day, washes produced a glazed sort of look and uh, with, a, with a gloss finish. And that's, you know, the old days, way, way back, the 80s, when I started modeling. And I did the same with uh, her. I gave her another color wash, which I feel is a lot better. This is the Scorch Brown. I think I'm just gonna work right off of that color and see what effect I get. But I felt like the dark color of the burnt umber, oh, wait a minute, I wrote it down, Scorch Brown and black. I think that darker color works better. And I think it actually came out pretty effectively there. Uh, but it, it could use some reds in there. So, you know, that, that's why that's why I'm here. So um, the next product up on the list is um, Citadel's N N uh, Oxide. And this is probably the most popular product on the market right now. Certainly, that's why it's next up on my list. But if you look at the video that Games Workshop released on YouTube about how to use it, they're using it as a wash. Let it flow into the cracks. That's wrong, <laughs> that's wrong. So uh, I started just before I turned on the camera using it and um, I wanted to see how I could use it without it producing a wash look. And I started to make some progress. So um, what I've been doing, I will continue here. Let's try it on a little more texture. Actually, no, I wanna stick on that, that cloak for a second. I wanna see if I can improve that look a little bit, intensify it in some areas. Um, well, so what I've been doing is I've just been applying a little bit, you know, here and there. And again, I don't want puddle 
edges. I don't want it to look like there's a strong, you know, wet line that dried. I think the only risk I see is that uh, it's going to produce a bit of a marble effect, I think. And I have very, very little on my brush right now. Just want to give you that heads up. Very, very little. And I think the risk is getting a marbling effect. So we'll, we'll see. Well, that's what we're here for. That's what I'm here for. And hopefully that's what you're here for. So let's see. So I rinse out my brush a little bit. I lightly pat it on the, oh, too much. Pat it on my towel to, to mostly dry my brush. But see those little wet marks? But if you stay on it, you can kind of, you can smooth, well, I was able to, there we go. You can kind of wet it into chunks to remove it and get rid of that wet line. Kind of was scrubbing out some of this. Yeah. I'd rather scrape off chunks of paint than leave that wet line. That's personal opinion, I guess. Boy, you can see how nice effect I got on the top of the cloak and how I'm really struggling. I'm gonna blame you guys I'm watching over my shoulder. Because you really got to get at it before it dries or you're just scraping off dried paint when you're continuing to work it. And uh, sometimes it's not fair. I mean, I'm looking at it at about three inches away. <laughs> and stepping back a bit, it looks more effective. I want something that really, that really goes as real as it can. And that means scaling the image, scaling the, the look down to the size. I don't know, I may try it. This, this might be an instance where using, I was thinking of a, of a damp stipple, if that makes any sense, like a dry brush stipple, uh, almost. Well, I'll say, stepping away from it, you know, I'm looking at it from about a foot away, that doesn't look too bad. That doesn't look too bad. I will say I like the color. No. Interestingly, the, um, uh, what is that? That's the burnt umber with the black wash. I think that gives not a bad foundational color though. And while I don't want it to puddle, that doesn't mean you don't want it in the little spots. Now, here's an interesting thought. Where I was struggling on the cloak, because it's a broad, flat area, it's really unforgiving for looking at, you know, uh, brush strokes or, or, you know, wet lines. And uh, here, this is much more forgiving. I'm thinking, you know, so I'm not trying to say nothing in the cracks. Don't get me wrong about that. That's going to look weird. But I don't know. I don't know. It's not bad. I don't think it's bad. I don't know. Of course, it's empty. Do you how you think it looks, but let's try hitting this. See, boy, let's like, I mean, it really, it is a wash. Its consistency is of a wash. You know, you can see right away. It's like, oh, I love being in the corners. So maybe let's try this. Let's just put some on and then take it off discriminately rather than trying to apply it discriminately. What do you think about that? So now it just looks like I put a glaze over it. I have lost a little detail on these models with all the layers of paint. But I wouldn't say these were the crispest models right from the get-go. I wish I could remember the brand of these minis. They're aimed at um, historical war gamers, I believe. And, uh... <sighs> Jesus, I hate that face. I don't like that. Maybe I just need to try building it up uh, more discreetly. Well, I guess I'm going to say, uh, don't try for the... Apply it broadly and go for a cleanup. I will do that, I guess. And I think I need to go back. I think I need to look at some of the photos one more time. And uh, see what I might be doing wrong in terms of, of looking for an overall effect. Because like I said, there's several, you know, variations of, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. 
See how it looks better? I think it looks better on the cloak. Feels a little more of an impression of chalkiness. A little bit more granular. I think that face looks terrible. All right, let me, uh, let's try on this little, I don't know what this would be, a leather armor skill, a uh, skilled guild? Boy, this just wants to just jump off the brush. Really, I think the trick is um, building it up, you know, putting it down in some areas. I have so little paint on this brush, paint, wash, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think you just have to put down just absolutely tiny amounts and then build it up from there. That's my gut instinct on this. I think the face, I think the face looks wrong because the entire surface has been covered. And I think, at least to my eye, I'm going to go back and look at those photos, that it's the absence of verdigris in some spots that helps build in a little realism. Well, I have many, 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 many more ideas about how, how to use this product. But I wanted to just try it on its own for a second. Hmm. All right, you know what? I'm going to leave that. I'm going to think about that. I got a backside I can use. Mm, cloak, but his hair is detailed. Let's try something. Let's try another product. Let's try... Let's try another product. I have two paints from Vallejo. Now what's interesting, well, we'll find out, but I suspect that these are going to have a thicker consistency. Oh, that's interesting. This is a verdigris glaze. This is, I think, a straight up paint. This is a game effects. No, 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 he says. This appears to be very similar, at least on my palette, to the oxide. Very similar to the oxide in consistency. Hmm. All right. Maybe, maybe this time I'll work from the bottom up. Ooh. Ooh. Right away. Holy Christ, did that dry fast. Wow. Okay. New technique for applying this is being sought. I think this is the time to try something else. This is a little stipple brush I made uh, a little while ago. So I just took a brush um, that has, hmm, I don't know what consistent, these almost look like china bristle, hog bristle. I don't think they are. But I cut it down pretty aggressively because I wanted something I could just jab and be. All right, but I'm going to take take paint off of this pretty aggressively as well. Like I said, sort of a dry brush stipple effect. Go ahead, tell me you dried on the brush. I have this put on a wet palette. And actually it makes me think that maybe cutting it with quite a bit of water so that you can apply small amounts and possibly retard its rapid drying or holy Christ I have retarder hmm I could add that too the options are endless you know when it comes to painting so many different products you can use so many combinations the problem with the stipple brush is I can't apply it more heavily to a small area because I'm just mashing it down. <laughs> Jesus. All right, let me, I gotta wash this brush. Anyway, I, I don't think using this without a wet palette is a good idea. I'm just gonna leave a big blob of soap right on the brush just to keep it from uh, drying out. All right, but I'm gonna, let's try this. I'm gonna cut it with the, I'm gonna cut it with a fair amount of water, actually. Because I still need to take you know, I need to dry my brush off a little bit. I 
Yeah. Well, I like the foundation with the stippling. I don't, hmm, I don't know. I don't feel like I have enough control. I mean, obviously, unless you're unless you're really uh, <laughs> gung ho about your army, you know, you can't take this much time on every miniature. But maybe you're just doing it on a on a shield or. What I do like about this is that, um, I don't know, maybe it's because it's been sitting on the shelf, but uh, I do feel like it has a, a chalkier consistency than the uh, oxide, which I think produces an overall better result. That's my personal opinion at this stage. I kind of, I kind of fixed that. Maybe that's not a fair comparison to the Nihilac Oxide, because I didn't really go as heavy in some areas. I don't know. That's a little that's a little too intense, if you ask me. However, I have been thinking about combining materials, so that is an option for going back even over these uh, spots. All right. I'm going to save some of the rest of her for another... All right, you know what, before I leave it, I was thinking though, well, wait a minute. See, this has a, a generally overall subtle color. It's not, it's not super intense. And I think part of the problem here is I've just really gone too far. All right, well, I'd like to give it another chance here on our arm. And that gives me a, a little bit of texture to work with as well as a flat surface. This paint sets up so, so fast. Which actually, I mean, I say that and it's not often that I try to do things with paint like this. You know, take some off, move it around. Uh, I think I was a little spoiled by the model mates because it has that What I was kind of thinking earlier, though, is that because I don't try to do this with normal, you know, with my normal acrylics that uh, I paint with, I might be judging its drying time unfairly as it's it's a paint, you know, maybe more than well, that it might be drying as fast as my other paints do. And I just I don't play with them like this, so I've never really thought about how fast they set up. All right. So my idea is to play with it with some rubbing alcohol. Since that can act like a solvent for paint, maybe it gives me uh, some room to uh, tap into it like I would with uh, Model Mates. Whoa, whoa, hello, whoa. And I will say, a little goes a long way when it comes to the alcohol. You know, this is such a thin layer. Well, I'll say that. I think that improved it quite a bit, actually. I wouldn't say I'm super happy with it at the... Uh, the three inch range. Let's see if I can fix this a little bit too. I wish, though, know, the the way the alcohol is working is that it's not, you know, which makes sense. It's not dissolving the paint. It's just giving me the ability to lift off chunks of it, which, you know, ends up resulting in a bare spot. Oh, and I was going to say, I think um, having the gloss wash under it is probably, don't, don't quote me on this, but it's probably going to help um, prevent the underlying layers of paint from lifting off too easily. 
man, I'm, you know, I'm thinking of like 16 different ways I could test this, you know, like, okay, I have to test these two paints over a matte finish next. And then I have to, you know, well, Jesus, I can't, I can't do all that. At least not right now. I mean, this is going to take me, this is just this experimenting is going to take me like two and a half days, I think. Well, they're not full eight hour days. They should be. Today could be. Oh no, I have D&D &D tonight. Oh, see? Because I often get a late start in my day. Sometimes I stay up too late. And uh, I like working at night. You know, like around eight o'clock, sit down. Well, I'll say, though, that that helped that area quite a bit. All right. I, I shouldn't, but I'm going to play with the skirt because I think the skirt is... I, I think I should try for an overall effect because some of these areas are just visually distracting to me. Here's another advantage of um, using the alcohol is that when it does lift off the paint and I grab a chunk and I remove it, it uh, leaves an irregular tear, if you will, in the paint layer. And that really is helping to break up, you know, those, uh, those wet spots, uh, you know, the, um, the water lines, the dry lines from it. And I will also add that I am being, you know, very, very gentle with my brush. You can probably tell just, you know, just the tip of it. Apply a little more pressure if it's not moving, but really, I am not tearing into this with any kind of level of aggression. All right, that looks a little bit better. See, rubbing alcohol. If you don't have a bottle on the shelf, you are missing out. I hope, I hope some of this is in frame. <laughs> it's hard to concentrate on everything all at once. And the, the actual frame in the camera for these things is pretty, it's pretty goddamn small. So if I move an inch and a half over, ooh, ooh, can you see that lifting up? That's interesting. Well, I like that a lot better. That, that helped. That helped a lot, I think. I actually, now I need to put down notes. This just seems, it's a glaze. First of all, that's interesting. Oh, look at that, all the things it does not contain. Arsenic, barium, cadmium, chromium, mercury, lead, selenium. The hell's else SB? Cobalt. <laughs> okay. One thing I don't like about how these are coming out is I'm not getting a good color variation under the verdigris. You know, like, of course, this is heavily covered. You know, but here, right, we have a lot of black, which is okay. But when it goes to the verdigris, it passes through the red stage. Let me go take a look. I'll be back in a second. Well, my internet is giving me a little problem right now. So, uh... We move on without looking at pictures. But I like this. This has got a much more red foundation. This is the burnt umber with a uh, black wash. No, I'm sorry, hull red. And I think that is a nicer foundation color in general. And uh, plus it's got some of the black. Uh, whereas, you know, here, right, it's... Um, I actually didn't do a second black wash over the back of her. And it really just created um, a dark, you know, dark, dark overall tone that isn't very red. I don't know. All right. Enough gabbing. So next up on our plate is the Verdigris Glaze from Vallejo. This is their model color. And right out of the, the bottle, it is a paint. It has the... A, a fairly thick consistency. Maybe that's because of um, I haven't uh, mixed it well. I, I shook it quite a bit, though. I suppose it must be fine, though. Otherwise, lots of uh, medium would just come out. All right. 
So I hope you enjoyed that look at uh, some of my questing towards verdigris. And in the uh, next video in this series, which will be the final installment, I'll, also, I'll be looking at some weathering pigments and trying to figure out how I can use those to enhance or, or create a better effect. But before we go any further, we have to do viewer comments. Moon Cabbage uh, makes the comment that viewer comments might be better on its own day. Uh, so he, he was, I, he, she, uh, it's hard to tell with Moon Cabbage. They were uh, saying, you know, maybe it's like something on Friday. That question is, uh, and I think there may be more than one, is integrated into my survey. And I have decided that I will be going through the survey with all of you uh, in a separate video. Uh, that will be like a little bonus video for the week. And we'll go through those and I'll give you some of my thoughts on uh, what some of those results look like and where they might take the channel going forward. So uh, keep your ears tuned for that, especially you, Moon Cabbage. Moon Cabbage also mentioned that I could consider doing something like uh, a shorter series that might have a higher draw to the channel um, or, you know, would generate more traffic, something like that, and was describing doing like a paint along. So maybe a popular piece of uh, something from GW and then it sound paint along. It, it wasn't explained any more than that, but I'm interpreting it as, you know, uh, you get to the same kind of like, you know, it's kind of like following a Bob Ross show. And you get your paints out and we're going to make happy rust effects. So that's an interesting idea. I also had an idea about doing it as a build along, maybe for like a diorama basing or something like that. Uh, so I'm gonna revisit that in just a second. Steve Mixon had a suggestion that I should consider putting, um, uh, I should consider, would I consider? I don't know. A cutting mat underneath my badge table so that it uh, creates a more neutral background, less reflection, and also comes handily with its own grid because I've had to put, I put some lines on my table. You might notice them if you look around uh, to try to help guide me to the center of the frame. Uh, and I think that's a fantastic idea. So I'm going to, uh, oh, cat, I am going to look into that for sure. And he also mentioned, and this was mentioned by another commenter, but I couldn't find the comment uh, about me just shooting a segment of me working at the bench where I don't talk. Something that would be like quick and easy where I could just upload that. It's an interesting idea, you know, for somebody who, you know, wanted to just kind of watch a little bit about what I'm doing just to, you know, visually take it in. But uh if that's something that more than those two people are interested in, you know, put a little thing in the comment uh, and let me know. It's something I could consider uh, because it would be potentially very, very low impact time-wise to shoot and, and edit. Uh, I don't know what, it, what, it, what it's going to look like. I mean, it'd just be shooting of me working at the bench with maybe some relaxing music underneath it or something. I don't know. Put a comment there if you think that's something you're interested in or God, you're like, God, don't do that. Anything is helpful. And he also mentioned doing a diorama build along or something similar for, um, for what are they called? What are they, wait a minute. They're called uh, the Funk Pop Minis. They're weird minis. They're kind of cool. They're kind of weird. They're kind of wrong. I don't know. Funk Pop Minis. So there again, we see this idea of a build along. So I'm almost reluctant to say this, but I appreciate your feedback so much. I have been considering doing some classes and that's a very different kind of uh, format than doing, say, a series of videos as a build along, maybe charging a small amount for them uh, because, uh, wait a minute, I am gonna look at my notes right here. Who was it? I think it was in Moon Cabbages saying that, um, you know, back in the day you could get like a magazine article or something. It was like $2 for the first one and then they'd show you subsequent steps and then you could, you know, buy the subsequent steps or something like that, which is kind of, kind of like a tutorial. Uh, but I think the interesting idea about it is that it's more uh, Bob Ross in that make sure you have all these paints in front of you. Make sure you have these materials and we're gonna build this together. You're gonna finish with this product, which is what I wanted to do, want to do with a class because then I can have 
uh, real one-on-one -on -one time with a few people and guide them through the process of creating uh, their own uh, water piece or, or diorama base or whatever it may be. And that would be a similar kind of do with me. And I will check over your shoulder via cameras to uh, see how you're doing and give you tips. Uh, that's a little bit more uh, intensive for me to run and would cost a lot more. Uh, but it gives you that really sort of one-on-one -on -one attention, you know, one-on-four maybe, one-on-six, I don't know. But if there's a strong uh, desire for it being as a little video series, build along with me uh, or paint along with me or do vertigree along with me, you know, with like a little material list and, you know, we're going to go through that together. Um, put any thoughts you think about that down in the comments. Let me know. I think, though, before you put any comments down, that this idea is intriguing enough and there are enough variants within this kind of a concept that I think I'll probably create another survey that will be specifically related to these things. And I will beg and plead for you to come and fill out that survey. So uh, keep your ears, eyes pr pricked. Don't prick your eyes. Attuned to the channel. And uh, there will be something, no doubt, about that in the not too distant future because it's something I've been thinking about quite a bit over the last uh, month or so. Two Guns Painting uh, leaves a comment basically saying something to the effect of, I'm editing my videos too much choppy and it's, it's feeling choppy and it's making him, I think it's him, uh, a little crazy or annoyed because it has been something I've been thinking about and I am trying to edit things very tightly because of the length of the videos and to cut out ums and ahs. And I think I might be going too far. There's something to be said for preserving a dialogue like flow. And it's also taking me a lot of time to cut all those little, mm -mm -mm, those little things out. So I'm going to be doing in this video, once I edit it, uh, I'm going to be trying to take a little bit of a fresher look at it and see uh, how I can learn and, and improve that. And it's, uh, a fine comment to leave because oftentimes it's things I've been wondering about. So it's really great to hear that feedback from you guys. Kevin De, De Leon, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, left a comment about how it would be easier to create vertigree effects by dry brushing. And I have uh, two things to say on that. And I actually had an exchange with Kevin and if uh, I don't remember which video it is. And we, we kind of went back a couple times about it, which was great. That um, I'm trying to create a very realistic effect and dry brushing will not match that, uh, that effect well enough, which is what I also think about washes. Saying that, if you are going to be doing a lot of miniatures, I've got an army to do and I've got, you know, 100, 100 minis and I want all their guns to have vertigree on them. Uh, don't don't try to do what I'm doing. Jesus, <laughs> you know, take take nylock oxide and just drizzle it on there and it's going to look good and it's going to look great for an army. Don't get me wrong in thinking that I'm not saying you can dry brush. Remember, nothing's wrong. Nothing's right. It's not about what you can or can't do. It's about what your goal is. And so dry brushing or washes, or maybe a combo of the both, can produce very good effects, especially when you're looking to uh, do quite a lot of work, um, or maybe you're not doing quite a lot of work. You spend too much time on a single project and you never finish it. So how much your time is worth to invest in the piece can often influence what technique you might want to pursue. So thank you, Kevin, for that. So I just want to thank everybody who left comments. These are super helpful, and I want to encourage everybody to feel free to leave constructive criticism comments at any time on any topic that you think uh, you feel like you would like to chime in on because I pay attention to them. I take them very seriously, and I usually, I usually learn from it in some way, shape, or form. So um, encouragement to continue forward on such a direction. And with all of that, I just want to um, uh, remind you that if you want to support the channel, if you like the videos uh, that I'm producing and the content, uh, this video uh, channel is uh, ad-free and currently it's sponsor-free. So it's really the support from uh, viewers like you that help to keep it going and to help it grow.
Uh, you can also tell a friend about the channel uh, anywhere you think people might be interested in coming to visit it. That was always helpful as well. And if you're uh, interested in just making a one-time contribution, whatever amount, a dollar helps a lot. There's a PayPal me link in the bottom in the description, and that's another option that's available to you as well. So I want to thank you for joining me. And uh, the next video in this series, which will be the final one, will be um, sped up footage. So I'm going to shorten that a little bit, and I'm going to do a voiceover on it and uh, give you a little bit more of a technical summary of what I've learned because the final installment, which I've actually already shot, um, is really where I finally feel like I have some resolution to this technique and I feel like I understand it now and where I can go with it in the future. So if that interests you, hopefully I'll see you again because you know that I will be back in a week with another Terrence Gibbs video.